Welcome to episode number 15 of the Riverfront Bengals show, where we come to you every Thursday to discuss the week that was and the days to come in Cincinnati Bengals land, usually in completely and utterly nonsensical ways. It's we are the very, it's true. We are the very show that was recently recognized as the sixth most dangerous podcast in the micro nation empire of Adamia. We are your hosts. I'm Nate Dotson. He's Joe Farsing. Joe, my man, how the hell are you? Uh, better if I knew where the hell the micronation of Adamia was. I'm guessing it's somewhere in the South Pacific. It was in the United Kingdom. It Not was a, close. I just Googled obscure nation. I didn't Google anything. We were actually number six there. It's South true. Pacific, North Atlantic. You know, it's six and one half dozen. It's the over there. I'm doing great, man. What about yourself, buddy? I can't complain a bit, and we are about to have a real good time talking about Cincinnati's Week 13 win over the Kansas City Chiefs. But before we get too far down that rabbit hole, if you don't mind, or even if you do, go give us a like, follow, subscribe, wherever you consume this podcast. And we are available everywhere. It helps us reach more people, and reaching more people is a good thing, unless you're talking about Hollywood film and television star Kevin Spacey. So, <laughs> let's jump right in, Joe. I, <laughs> I don't know where to go after that, man. I mean, I guess the first place to go is a preview of next of this week's game with Deshaun Watson. <laughs> I was going to say, we could have substituted Deshaun Watson in there, and I thought about it. But I was like, let's, let's go a different direction. <laughs> Joe, did you hear that your Cincinnati Bengals beat Patrick Mahomes, Andy Reid, and the Kansas City Chiefs for the third time this year? What a freaking game, man. Yeah, How that you was feeling a- now? That was an absolute fun one to watch. I mean, they got out to the big lead early, 14-3, to three, and you're thinking, you know, okay, they're going to kind of control the game. Well, Patrick Mahomes is still Patrick Mahomes. He led him back to the um, air Mahomes kind of leap to the goal line and then lost the ball. I was hoping, praying that he came out, you know, whatever. They scored. Bengals won ultimately, so we're good. Um, just the clean, efficient game on offense. Um, they did, you know, they again, they did what they wanted to do. They're uh, – Bengals balance was almost 50% pass to run ran more than I would have expected them to. Cause you figure a game like this, they're going to be throwing and throwing and throwing to try to keep up. Um, but they, you know, they were running, they're uh, running the ball efficiently enough, 152 yards on the ground. Um, and then Joe Burrow doing what Joe Burrow does 279 efficient passing yards, 81% completion, two touchdowns um, in the air, one touchdown on the ground. So um, when they get that efficiency, they're unbeatable. They are the number two pass offense efficiency, um, number two ru- or number I forget the exact number, but uh, number two rush offense since uh, since week seven, um, and you know how efficient their pass offense is. So you get that kind of balance, and it, it, it's unbeatable. Yeah, it was a wild game. I mean, Samaj had twenty seven touches for one hundred and fifty five yards on the day. Which leads us to the question, that includes the, you know, six catches for 49 in those. He's got to stay on the field, even when Mixon returns. I mean, if you take away that Panthers game, I don't have the stats in front of me. But if you want to talk about efficiency and you want to talk about consistency, the offense has looked better and the running game has looked better with Samaj getting the most snaps under center. I'm not arguing that he is a better back. I'm not arguing he is more talented. But I think it's clear that he has earned a – much bigger role than we would have thought two weeks ago. Yeah, I think what they should do is kind of go in with the thoughts that it's going to be um, play the hot hand. I mean, give each each guy kind of an equal opportunity, you know, a, a drive here, drive there, so mix them in and out until you see who's running more effectively. Um, he's absolutely earned it, uh, but Mixon has the full body of, uh, you know, much larger body of work, you know, six years in the league, but uh, having too many talented ball carriers is not a bad thing whatsoever. So it, it, it's no. good to see, you know, you, you have your lead dog out and they didn't miss a beat. P Ryan runs differently than Mixon, but he still runs hard and he's just going to run straight at you and run through you. And uh, I texted this to my father-in-law. He runs at the defense. Like they just slapped, slapped his mama. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope that didn't actually <laughs> happen, but if it did, it explains a lot. Yeah. Um, we have to talk about the man. We did not actually talk about the man last week. We, we realized after recording last week that we don't think we mentioned Joe Burrow one time. How's that happen? If, if any stat tells you how good this team is playing as a unit, offensively and defensively, that is probably the, the, uh, the biggest standalone fact is that we didn't even need to mention 
uh, Mr. Burrow, but he was incredible. Um, like you said, he was 25 of 31 for 286 yards, two touchdowns, 11 rushes, 46 on the ground with another touchdown. So just about as efficient as you can ever get. He was as cool as ever. I have no idea how he stayed in the pocket that long on the game winning uh, first down throw to T Higgins. And speaking of the pocket, you know, he had, he had 25 clean pockets in this game. Yeah. Um, Let's touch on Burrow for a minute before we get on that offensive line. Yeah, he um, I mean, he threw for 286 yards, completed zero passes that traveled over 20 yards in the air. And it doesn't matter. This is huge. This is this is one of the big talking points we had the first half of the season. Absolutely. It was they were struggling like they it, it was weird. They knew they were going to come out and play a lot more cover two against them and they had no answer for it. And all of a sudden he's absolutely dynamite. Um since week two, or since week two, sorry, since week seven, he's the best in the league. So what does that cover? Six games. Like, he, he's the best, the most efficient uh, yards per attempt. Um, and th- they've absolutely figured it out. I, I don't have the exact numbers that he had in this game. They're kind of, like, sometimes it takes a little bit to, what's that? Yeah, we don't need, and we don't need to go too crazy. I'm going yeah. to touch on Burrow a little bit more, a little, a little teaser for you later in the episode. Yeah. Um, so, so now if, if you're a defense, what do you play against them? Like that was the whole thing. You play cover two to keep everything in front of them. Well, he's finding all these open spots, but you, you know, so now do you go man to man and put chase or Higgins on an Island? Do you load the box? Cause the, uh, cause the run game is going so efficient is running so efficiently right now. And you try to take the run away. I mean, you can't, you literally have to pick something to try to take away and hope that you don't get killed on everything else. And it doesn't matter. They're just killing you. Yeah, and you know it makes it really hard to um, take take things away when you have the ability to spread the ball around the entire yeah. field. And on top of the offensive line only um, giving up four hurries on the day in one sack, Burrow had time to go through all of his reads. He had five players with multiple catches with more than one catch, and he had eight players catch at least one, one pass. Man, how many, how many teams in the NFL have eight guys – that can catch passes in games against the, the team that going into this week were the favorites to win the Super Bowl. It was yeah, awesome. I mean, again, it, it's just the sheer amount of talent that this team has accumulated. You can't take somebody away because someone else is going to make you pay. Bengals played four games without one of the top five most dynamic wide receivers in the game, and they were three and one. T. Higgins, you know, had over four hundred yards receiving in those four games. Uh, they played two and a half, almost three games without Joe Mixon. Now, doesn't matter. Samaj P. Ryan's running for you know running for mm-hmm. over hundred yards, or you know making all these uh, misses on on these catches and everything. So, you can miss a guy with injury, or you can have someone just having a bad game, or defense can absolutely scheme to take that person away. I mean, double or triple team one side of the field to take away Chase. Okay, we'll just nickel. We'll you know we'll just go over the top with. Uh, with T. Higgins or hit you underneath in the slot with Boyd, or we'll just run the ball on you. Pick yeah. poison. It doesn't matter. And you mentioned that all world wide receiver, uh, Jamar Chase, looked like Jamar Chase, seven catches for 97 yards. Didn't get any end zone, but that's just a matter of time. He was he was big boy and defenders out there. T. Higgins only had three catches for 35 yards, but two of those three catches were ridiculous. The uh, absolute di- difference makers, the touchdown and then the first down in traffic to ice the game, if you will. So a lot of production from, you know, the usual suspects, the guys that this team needs to have clicking to, to make the deep run we know they're capable of. Yeah, and, and I haven't seen it usually every week. Uh, Next Gen Stats comes out with the most improbable completions by, you know, pick a quarterback, and they'll pick like the three or four most improbable or the lowest completion percentage changes. I didn't see it this week. I really want to see what the chances on that third and 11 catch were. Uh, the proximity of I mean, he had two defenders within what an arm's reach of Burrow when he delivered the pass. He had a guy in his face. He, yeah, he, I, mean, I mean, right. I mean, he knew he was, was going to get his ass do. laid out the moment yeah. that ball left. Absolutely. And uh, cornerback draped all over Higgins. I mean, it was fantastic coverage. Mm-hmm. But when you've got a receiver who is six foot four and has arms that are about 10 foot seven. And a quarterback with <laughs> that kind of pinpoint accuracy, it doesn't matter what defense, it doesn't matter what how well. I mean, that's a play that Kansas City is going to go back and look at that in the film room and be, we won this snap. Yeah, we did everything, everything right. We got pressure in his face. We had him absolutely covered. And they're just better. Joe Burrow has just mm-hmm. this freakish accuracy. 
And T. Higgins just has this catch radius and vice, you know, vice hands to just. Yeah, and let's talk about that play call. I mean, what a uh, what a big balls play call by Zach Taylor. I feel like almost every other team in the league punts that ball and and or runs the ball. I'm sorry, runs the ball, runs time off the clock, gives Cincinnati the least amount of time possible to work with. But he said, "No, nah, I've got, I've got Joe Burrow, and I've got all these weapons. Let's just win the game right now." And it worked. What is it that? Like as uh, Happy Gilmore when he's trying to putt. Uh, at the very end of the match, when the uh, the camera tower falls over on top of the green, yeah. and he goes, "But Dick, no, I'm just going to go ahead and win it right here." <laughs> now you say that we could have brought that brought that clip up during the show. Well, you already ate into one of my one of my clips later, so I mean, oh, did I? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it's Zach Taylor has confidence. I mean, if this this were Marvin Lewis, they would have just run the ball, run the ball, run the ball, try to get you know, try to get three yards, three yards, three yards, you know. And then punted the ball away and tried to play defense. Zach Taylor is he's got an assassin at, at a quarterback and he's gonna win the game. He's gonna ask his team to win the game instead of try, you know, try not to lose. And when you play not to lose, as you can see, year after year in the playoffs with Marvin Lewis, like that, that's when you lose. When when you're playing afraid, that's when you lose. And they're not afraid. They are the hunters. They're not the hunted, they're the hunters. They're going out and they're trying, you know, and they're trying to uh, take your soul. Yeah, they're really uh, just just leaning into this. They have to play us mantra. Yeah, but let's move on to the defense real quick. Uh, the first person I want to mention is Jermaine Pratt, um, the only defender that really had an elite game. I guess you would say he rated out a ninety-one point two. Um, you know he 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 had the play of the day, right? He he just big boyed Travis Kelsey, the best tight end of the planet, one of the best tight ends of all time if not the best tight end of all time, to uh, strip the ball, cause the game-changing fumble that led the way. Man, how happy were you for Jermaine? Joe, I've lost you. You got me? Can you hear me? Yeah, there you go. Okay, cool. Sorry about that. I was trying to move my microphone, and I guess I turned it on mute. (laughs) Uh, I mean, this is this is where he's been for the past month. I mean, he has been the best defender on the team. I mean, DJ Reader, you know, his his impact came back is huge, but Pratt is making plays in the running game. He's making plays in coverage and even, you know, just hustle plays like that. That's a play because the Bengals hustle so much to the ball. And, and because they're uh, gang tackling, he was able to, you know, to go strip the ball and not having to worry about uh, Bur- or, uh, Kelsey slipping the tackle. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, that's just him wanting it more. And this is, I mean, he makes big plays Uh, in the playoffs. He's the one that had the game ceiling interception against the Raiders last year and game one of last year, he caused Dalvin cook or he forced the fumble on Dalvin cook that gave the Bengals the ball back so they could drive down and kick the game winning field goal. This is just the guy who, you know, this is the guy who he is and he's changing the math right now. He's the 10th highest graded linebacker in the entire NFL. Wow. Um, And, Everyone was talking about that no matter what happened, this is Pratt's last year of his rookie deal. They're going to have to let him walk. Logan Wilson is the impact linebacker, and this is Wilson's third year, so he's able to uh, – they can start working on his second drive. Do they still think that? Pratt's been far and away the better corner, like the better linebacker. But Wilson's been fine, but Pratt's been one of the best linebackers in the game. Do you let that guy walk, or do you roll your dice and say, okay, we're going to sign him long term? And then figure out something with Wilson or draft Wilson's replacement in the offseason. Yeah, you have, you have to think that um, they, they've sent a few text messages after a couple of celebratory cocktails after that game to Jermaine Pratt's agent being like, hey, what, what, are, you, what are you doing later? You want you want to chat? Absolutely. And that's, you know, and, and year after year, I and mean, he's been coming on and getting a little bit better each year, a little bit better each year. But this year he's a stud. I mean, he's not Fred Warner. But he's not far behind. Again, 10th yeah. rated linebacker in the entire league. And you, you just watch him on play. He's coming fast. Like, he's never been known as a covered linebacker. He's a huge, big boy. He's, you know, a guy you think that's going to be a run stuffer. But he's been fantastic in coverage. And he's got that sideline to sideline speed to track down ball carriers. And he's got that ball hawk playmaker ability that the Bengals severely lack. That's the one thing that they don't have on defense is a huge playmaker. But Pratt kind of fills that role. Yeah, and he has shown up at 
huge, huge important moments time and time again. It seems like for, with every Bengals win this season, he has made a big play late that really just changed the momentum. That's completely arbitrary. I don't know if it's true, but it sure seems that way. And you better believe that his agents will be bringing that up when it comes time for these contract negotiations. But speaking of guys that have shown up in a big way, um, even with limited opportunities, Joseph Osai, um, you can't say no, man. He, uh, that, that sack he had to knock, uh, you know, knock him out of field goal range, which they ended up missing. I think it was the second sack of the season. Talk about making the most of your opportunities. What did you see out of Mr. Asai? He's a guy that has a ton of natural ability. I mean, he's the guy that came in last year and very first preseason game after getting drafted. And he looks like Lawrence Taylor out there running around chasing after the go Tom Brady. Then he summarily tears his, you know, blows his knee out in that game, has to miss the entire season. Uh, they had the high expectations of him coming in this year, kind of probably unnaturally high for someone who was only a third rounder last year and then had to miss an entire year with a knee injury, but they need depth, uh, especially pass at uh, pass rusher, because outside of Trey Hendrickson and Sam Hubbard, there there's not a lot of guys out there that are, you know, going to rush the passer. He has that speed. He's got that bend. He's got the ability to be that big time pass rusher with more experience. Mm -hmm. uh, he absolutely beat his man inside on that move on that play on the third down. Uh, Patrick Mahomes does what he does. He escapes. He steps up in the pocket, misses it. Osai doesn't qu doesn't quit. He turns around, spins, and dives at his ankles. And the important, I think, the more important thing of that play, not, you know, besides the sack and having him lose a couple yards that caused the field goal attempt, Mahomes injured his foot a little bit on that play. So you wonder if Mahomes wasn't injured, would Andy Reid have rolled the dice and gone for it on fourth and five? Could uh, have you um, if you were watching the game live. They ran off the field as soon as. The whistle got blown. Patrick Mahomes didn't stick around to wait and see if they were going to bring anybody, uh, you know, give him a chance to go forward on four. He ran right off the field. So you think that had to have something to do with it. And you just brought up something that I, uh, I'm i glad you mentioned. He ran past Patrick Mahomes. The hustle that he showed to get back to him and not giving up on that play was incredible. I mean, the dude saw 12 total snaps in the game. He only rushed the passer five times and got that sack man make the most of those opportunities joseph yeah um, I, mean, I also wanted to point out i'm oh, sorry go ahead i was gonna say and that i mean that caused andy reed to do un andy reed things i mean he's you know he's got that you know he's got the same assassin type quarterback to where you know they're gonna play for the win not just to play not to lose and they ended up playing not to lose and bit him in the ass because they missed the field goal I mean, Harrison Bucker is going to make that kick nine times out of ten, but mm -hmm. he missed it. And best case scenario, they're giving Joe Burrow the ball back with over three minutes of game time to go down and for a game time, you know, game winning field goal. And that's what they forced them to do. They forced them out of their game plan. Yep, that's not like it happened a lot. That's not the Chiefs. No, not at all. Um, one other defender I wanted to mention real quick is uh, Cam Taylor Britt, just because I thought he had an interesting game. Um, he was bad against the run and bad at tackling, <laughs> but solid in coverage, which is a flop flip on what he has been all season long. So I don't know whether to be confused or encouraged that he got a little bit, little bit better in coverage or what, but um, I'll be keeping an eye on that. But mostly I want to say to everyone out there that 2024 is right around the corner. If you are not happy with either choice for – President of the United States of America, Lou Anarumo, is a solid write-in candidate. Agreed. Vote Lou 2024. Agreed. Joe, let's get to um, our awards section of this show. And I, I got a little lady that I want to see if uh, she can motivate you into picking a stud this week. Tell me about it, stud. <laughs> How could you not be inspired after seeing beautiful Olivia Newton-John. Joe, who is your uh, Olivia Newton-John stud of the week? It's our favorite lineman or favorite offensive lineman from the North Dakota State Bison. Right? Bison? Bison, yeah. So. Anyway, 100% uh, pass efficiency blocking. He allowed zero pressures. Cordo Volson was fantastic. Highest grade of the season, 76.6. Uh, .6. He was the highest graded Bengal period by PFF. Uh, as 
good of a game as Burrow and receivers and Piran had Cordo Volson was the best player, the uh, uh, best player on offense in the eyes of PFF. So he absolutely deserves it. He's ascending. I mean, that, that, that's kind of a phrase that you hear the, all these analysts say he's an ascending player every week after week. It's more stable that the line he's got veterans on either side of him. And you can tell that he's listening to these guys. He's taking the coaching and he's not making the same mistakes week after week after week, he's going to have some bad reps. He's going to give up a sack. He's going to give up pressures, but it's more consistent week after week. I mean, he's Reduce a fourth it. rounder and, and he's playing right now. He's playing like a you know seven year veteran. He's 11 years old who played football at a university. That's probably in the micronation kingdom of Adania. Like this guy is we had no expectations, and we said it over and over again throughout the season, even when the line was playing poorly. You know, we gotta, we can't give this guy a hard time. We got to give him a break because he got thrust into the situation probably before he's ready. Well, we – I mean, we weren't right. I mean, we weren't wrong when we said that. Yeah. But I did not expect him to progress the way he has this quickly. The whole line as a unit is playing really, really well. And I would like to see if uh, – where the offensive line rankings ended up after this week. I'm going to start keeping an eye on that week to week because starting out as poorly as they did and being up to uh, you know, 16th last week and probably higher now, it's incredible. And to see Cordell as the number one rated 15, so we're climbing. Love yeah. it. Yeah. Seeing him as the most highly rated offensive player is just fantastic, and it's a sign of um, you know his, his teachability. Um and just how hard all these guys are working and how well they're playing as a unit. Yeah. I mean, he was um, someone that you would hope would start playing into a solid offensive line by the end of the year. Again, all he had to do was be better than Jackson Carmen, which I think you or I could go out there and uh, give better reps than Jack, uh, than, uh, than Carmen could. And he's taken that. And again, now he's a solid offensive lineman. And, you know, I'm not saying he's going to be all pro and, you know, all pro next year, make, make multiple Pro Bowls, but you just need solid linemen. You don't need to have Joe Thomas, Anthony Munoz, Willie Anderson, you know, Nate Newton, all these Hall of Famers on your line. You just need guys that don't suck. And right now, I mean, Jonah Williams has turned his play around again since the bye week. And, and what I was hoping and what I'd said here, what I was hoping is, you know, he's getting another week away from the knee injury. Uh, his plays turnaround has gotten a lot better. Uh, Lyle Collins, he's gotten to be a lot better. It's these guys are no longer in the seventies and eighties with their rankings for linemen. They're, I mean, most of them by and large, they're in the middle to the back, you know, in the back half of the league outside of Kappa and Volson or Kappa and Kara, sorry. Um, but it's a solid union. Again, they're the, you know, 15th yeah. middle of the pack. How many times did we cry for a middle-of-the-pack offensive line last year? Yeah. What could this team do with a middle-of-the-pack offensive line? Mm -hmm. And I bet those rankings look a lot different if you start them uh, right around week seven. Ah, seven. Even, even week three, you take out just the yeah. two shitty weeks against Pittsburgh and, and Dallas. And, again, you're playing Hall of, you're playing against Hall of Fame talent there. So that's, you know, those are guys that make everyone look stupid. That's exactly right. So very, very deserving stud of the week. But where there are studs, there are often <laughs> – does. Yes! Randy Watson! <laughs> that boy is good. Mm -hmm. Good and terrible. <laughs> Randy Watson. <laughs> I'll never get enough of that clip. All right, so my Randy Watson dud of the week. This is a very, very tiny dud nomination because I don't like, you know, we don't like giving out duds after awesome games like that, but small little nod to Tyler Boyd. He wasn't terrible, despite grading out horribly and everything blocking related, but that drop on third and three, when he was just about as open as a receiver can get, just trotting right into the end zone, it was bad. It, it forced Cincinnati to settle for a field goal that thankfully didn't come back to bite him, but it wasn't great. Um, so since the Dud Award is meant to get players back on track, Tyler, please just go back to never, ever dropping passes which is usually what you do, as opposed to this recent bout of dropping one pass. I think, I think he'll be fine. It's one of those where you, you'll see a, t a play like that where a tight end is wide open in the middle of the end zone, a guy that's just not expecting the ball, or you don't expect to be that wide open, and they just drop it because they're, you know, 
and that's kind of what it looked like. He there, there was nobody that ball, that ball was just lofted perfectly over his shoulder, right into his hands, and it's almost like, oh shit, what do I do? <laughs> this shouldn't be this easy. Don't don't screw it up. Don't screw it up. Ah shit, I screwed it up. <laughs> <laughs> That was like definitely something that I would do if I was. Playing. Yeah, it, it, it's like a ground ball to you when you're playing infield in little league. Like, I'm oh, no, don't make an air. Field it, field it, field it. Shit. <laughs> I do have a my own dud that's not on the Bengals, but can we talk a little more about everyone's favorite uh, whooping boy in Kansas City's backfield? Uh, just to please, read. please. Uh, after the game, he came out and said, you know, said the right stuff. Like, listen, you know, this, you know, I, I respect these guys. Blah 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 blah. Tuesday, he gets on social media because he's not on the team, and he said, "Yeah, we lost, but I wasn't wrong." <laughs> Basically, doubling <laughs> down on like, oh, you know, never mind that they got the loss. Never mind that he got put on a poster by Samaj P. Ryan. Uh, he was only credited with two missed tackles. P. Ryan ran him over three times. He gave him another angry run where he just dribbled his head like a basketball off the turf on a run uh, on another run, ran right through an arm tackle on a pass reception. He ran him over. I, I guess they didn't give him a missed tackle on that because he was tackled immediately by another guy, but um, shut your mouth. You guys lost. Just shut up. Yeah. He, he had one pass come his way and I guess he can point to that saying I did great in coverage because they threw the ball once in his direction. Well, when the quarterback completes 80% of those passes, it doesn't matter the one rep that came your way. How, like, what are you banking on? Like, what are you bragging on? What's he you trying to lost. gain from that? Like, what's, yeah. what's your angle? What? I don't, I don't understand it. I saw it. I tweeted out, um, freedom of speech is a right, not an obligation. <laughs> like, just because you can speak freely, it doesn't mean you always should. So thankfully the, uh, the guy showed him up on the field, Jamar Chase, uh, got a taunting penalty <laughs> right in his face, which I loved. Um, one of those penalties I'm never going to complain about. But, yeah, just, just can. don't be an idiot. Um, <laughs> we, we do have a couple Ron Burgundy honorary milk was a bad choice nominees. So if you don't know what we're talking about. Oh, it's so damn hot. Milk was a bad choice. <laughs> I don't know why. I used to that so much. Um, I just wanted to throw out there, again, Zach Taylor called another stupid play on the goal line on fourth down. Uh, can we just stop using, you know, random players I've never heard of on sweeps on important plays when you have a 6'4 beast of a quarterback and – Two inches to go. Just let him fall forward. That, that's all I'm going to say about that. I wholly disagree with you there. Uh, well, I don't care. I'm just kidding. You're smarter than me, so go. Uh, Burrow, Burrow checked into the play. I mean, it was going to be a um, it was going to be the quarterback sneak. They had, I mean, they had it. Their alignment was one that he didn't like. He didn't like his chances there. He had to get, you know, I don't know how much of a full yard it was, but it, you know, it. He didn't like the look, so he checked into the, you know. Uh, into the sweep to Trent Taylor and credit Carlos Dunlop. He just made a hell of a play. That's a play with the end supposed to crash in on the uh, crash in on the line. And I don't know. Well, you're telling that. me that Zach Taylor didn't call that play. That was a burrow decision. Zach Taylor did not call that play. Now, okay, then I, I, I take it back. It was an awesome call. I completely understand it. Joe Burrow, you can do your no wrong. <laughs> I hope you don't listen to this podcast. Sorry. He does. It's the number one podcast in the burrow, in the burrow household. <laughs> His dad listens to it. His mom sent me a text. You know, just telling us, you know, take it easy on the guy on this play call. Um, no, I mean, and, and, and it's a play that people bash Zach Taylor and, okay, maybe then bash him for giving Burrow that check, you know, that, that look to check into if he wanted to. But that play has been run successfully by a lot of teams. Now the Bengals didn't run it successfully, but it got run against the Bengals a couple times this year on um, on end rounds. I, I, I think it was the, um, I want to say it's the Dallas game. CD Lamb to, uh, took one and ran for it on fourth and short, and because you've got the entire line crashing in to, uh, for the uh, for the sneak, it's Carlos Dunlap. God love him. And hated the way he ended up leaving Cincinnati, but mm -hmm. he had a hell of a career here and he made a hell of a play. He also barely got touched, so I don't know if there was a missed block or anything. He's supposed to be on. He's supposed to be unblocked. 
Oh, like that, okay. that's yeah. You, you, you leave the end works. unblocked there because you've got everyone that that the uh, the end is outside the formation, mm-hmm. so that he can scrape off. You know, try to peel back and and pull the guy. You know, pull him backwards if you know if they're trying to uh, push him into the end zone, kind of peel back. So it's it's meant to be unblocked, and he's also meant to crash. If he takes one step inside toward you know towards the actual formation, then Taylor walks in. Unfortunately, well, he, he sniffed it out. He, he he made a great call, or, or he made a great read. So, well, I'm no scientist, that. but my opinion was changed as soon as I found out that that was a Joe Burrow decision. Sorry, Joe. <laughs> um, you wanted to nominate another uh, questionable decision as well that we touched on a little bit earlier, but yeah, it was just Kansas City going uh, going for the field goal with uh, when there's about less than three uh, three and a half minutes left in the fourth quarter. Best case scenario, you're giving Joe Burrow the ball in a tie game to engineer game winning drive. We've seen this play out before. He doesn't leave time on the clock. He doesn't do the do a Josh Allen and, and, and leave a few seconds on the clock. He runs it all the way down and they score on the very last play. So again, that's the old Marvin Lewis playing not to lose stuff that mm-hmm. we got tired here. After, you know, we, we, we got tired of watching after seven you know, uh, playoff one and dones and, you know, go for the jugular, you know, who's on the other sideline, go win a game. And they, decided they'd rather, you know, try to, you know, try to tie it up instead of go for the win. And I'm all for it, but that clearly goal, goal, much like milk on a hot summer's day was a bad choice. Milk's never a bad choice unless it's cottage cheese, chunky and smelled. That's true. <laughs> Smell test the milk. Come here, follow the riverfront Bengal show for life advice and pro tips <laughs> such as that. Now, Joe, I owe you a bit of an apology. I knew the title of your award. I knew the clip to play when it was your turn for your specific award. But I didn't know what your award was about. (laughs) So I kind of ranted about your award anyway. But that's not going to stop us. Yes. (laughs) He received no official clearance. He just thought it up and did it. What balls. They were going to nail his ass to the floorboards for that. <laughs> now that I know yeah. the context of the clip, it's so much better. Yeah, usually we go for more whimsical, you know, comedies and everything with our awards. Uh, this is war here. We're talking the NFL. We talk. You have the Blitz, and you have you know all of these war things. This is war. So we're going to the Walter Kurtz Award for gigantic cojones. And that would be Zach Taylor for the play call on third and eleven on the final drive. Every ninety percent of the coaches are going to just run it there. You're going to run off another forty seconds of the play clock. You're going to be less than a minute. You know when you kick the you know try to kick the field goal to go up by six points. You got Patrick Mahomes on the other side. A minute, a minute and a half mm-hmm. to drive down the field, needing a game-winning touchdown. Again, we've seen that play out. He's going to you know it doesn't matter how well you've contained him. You don't give him that chance. So they passed a lot on that drive and. Uh, Twice Chase went out of bounds going for extra yards, and people were kind of given saying that he shouldn't have gone out of bounds. Well, he was fighting for extra yards. I'm okay with that because yeah. then they there was one, it was a nine yard gain. He went out of bounds, second and one. Well, that's then you just run the ball, pick up, you know, pick up that extra yard. It's not, you know, or there was the one when it was third and five. He took that little, little bubble screen, fought through four defenders, and dove for the first down and got it. Again, this is most teams aren't going to pass down in this, you know, you're just going to run the ball, run the ball, run the ball, try to run off two minutes of time, make them waste their timeouts. They went for the jugular. So this is for the third and 11. They missed that pass play. Mm-hmm. You know, again, you're, you're kicking, you're trying to kick a field goal and you're up six and you're giving Patrick Mahomes a minute and a half, the balls for that play. And again, the when biggest. you've got those guys, when you've got those guys, it doesn't matter. You're confident knowing that they're going to complete that pass. It was awesome. And I want to call on Elon Musk to do something worthwhile with Twitter and let us know how many left too much time for Patrick Mahomes tweets had to get deleted when T caught that pass. <laughs> I bet everybody had him queued up. Can't leave, can't leave Mahomes that much time. Too yeah. much time. Yeah. Well, it didn't matter because Zach Taylor is medically approved, not a concern at all. Gigantic testicles. Yeah. This week, I am going to give out the Pete Weber Honorary Who Do You Think You Are I Am Award to none other than Joseph Lee Burrow. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you're welcome. 
Strike to claim it. A strike to claim it. And he got it! That is why I said it! I said it! Are you kidding me? That's right! Who do you think you are? I am! <laughs> is that from oh, man, or Big Lebowski? I can't remember. <laughs> that is real life. That is probably the most profane segment we've played on here, and it was a professional bowler. So some background for those that don't know, Pete Weber is one of the uh, the goats of professional bowling, and after a match winning roll, had one of the all time great reactions. There it was. Um, the part that went viral was, "Who do you think you are? I am." It's so good. Well, where to start? I've never seen roid rage from a bowler before. By the way, it exists, and this it's is impressive. <laughs> So first, I know, you know, we all know that Joe Burrow is always Mr. Cool. But I have to believe that inside he was saying this, who do you think you are, I am, to himself about Patrick Mahomes, who at this point in his, in his career he freaking owns. In head-to-head matchups since 2021, Burrow is outperform, outperforming Mahomes in completion percentage, yards, yards per attempt, touchdowns, interceptions. Rushing yards, passer rating. And oh, yeah, he's ahead in the win loss column, three to zero. Better hair. Not, too. And way better hair. Yeah. And he's not just ahead in those categories, Joe. He's, he's ahead by a significant margin. But hey, let's not stop there. In his past 10 games, Burrow is averaging 8.29 yards per passing attempt, second best in the NFL. He leads the NFL in passer rating during that span at 111.4 and is completing an absurd 70.4% of his passes. On the season, he is PFF's fourth best rated quarterback in overall grade. And if you remove the first two games of the year when he was, you know, playing for the first time since rupturing his appendix, he jumps to the second highest graded passer behind only the Miami Dolphins to uh whose name I'm not even going to try to pronounce because I can't. And I think we can all safely agree that he is better than Tua. So, yeah, Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Tua, whose name I refuse to try and pronounce correctly due to an utter inability to do so. Who do you think you are? Joe Burrow is. <laughs> <laughs> There's my rant. Well, thanks for coming to my TED Talk. Okay, you might not be able to say Tonga Vailoa, but can you spell Tonga Vailoa? Without looking Only because at I food. typed it out. No, not without looking. <laughs> <laughs> I can cheat, and that's it. Can you spell DJ Jung? So yeah, I don't know if you want to go in on that. Something. I was going to say, can, can you spell DJ Jung, whatever the quarterback from Clemson that's transferring? Can you spell that? Or no. My favorite okay. guy was that, who's that player for the Steelers back in the day? Uh, Chris Fuamatu Maafalu. Ma- Ma- like Ma- Ma- There's also the uh, former Bengals legend. Natu Tuatagiloa. Let's just make my head hurt. There's, yeah, there's yeah, there's a lot of letters in there. A lot of my vowels. All right, so let's keep going on here. The uh, a little bit of playoff watch for you. Cincinnati and Baltimore are still tied, the top of the AFC North at eight and four. Baltimore still has that tiebreaker. Cleveland and Pittsburgh are both five and seven somehow, lingering around there. Um, you know, if we look back at Week 13. Lamar Jackson gets hurt. If he misses a game or two, things could get really interesting. Uh, Deshaun Watson made his return last week. We'll have to get into him a little bit more shortly, but he was terrible is the long story short of that. Pittsburgh's hanging around, just kind of playing generally better ball. Kenny Pickett's getting better and better every week, but still not good. And Cincinnati is now up to fifth in playoff seating. But for me, the most exciting part of that is they're only one game back from – the best record in the conference. So a lot of game to play, a lot of time left. Anything could happen. I'm feeling a whole lot better now than I was two weeks ago. How about you? Yeah. And, and the other thing about the playoff seating is if they keep playing this, they're going to have tiebreakers over literally every single team on the rest of the, uh, in the rest of the playoff thing. Yeah. Except right, for Baltimore. Okay, right. Yeah. Except for right now, the, um, the Ravens and that'll sort itself out by the end of the year. They've already got the tiebreaker. If there are any reason to need one between the Jets, the Dolphins, uh, the um, wow, totally spacing out the Chiefs here. They just played. They're going to play the Bills at home on, in Week 17. That's Bengals are damn near unbeatable at home. Not that they're not that I'm going to say they're going to win that game, but they should be favored in that game. 
Um, so all, all of those games looked a lot scarier a few weeks ago than they do right now. Oh, absolutely. And, and you look at the next three games. I mean, the Bengals, you know, all the, the back half, of the, the back half of the schedule is going to be scary. Yeah. The Bengals always struggle with the Browns. We'll get into a little bit of the reason for that later. Um, Buccaneers really looked that terrifying. I mean, they needed a last second Tom Brady pulling a win out of his ass against the Saints. On, it you know, an easy game, but they don't. They're not. They're not scary if both teams are playing to the yeah. uh, height of their potential. Then, I, then Cincinnati wins. Exactly. Uh, Patriot. You know, New Patriot yeah, you've got to go up to Foxborough on Christmas Eve, and yeah, it's, the weather's probably going to be. Weather shitty. can happen. Yeah, but Cincinnati's a better team. Oh, a absolutely. way better team. Yeah, I mean. Patriots have a really good defense. Their offense is just terrible. No, Mac Jones is garbage, which is French yeah. for garbage. I don't know if you knew that. I didn't. Thank you. It's yeah. lesson of the yeah. day. Educational um, pocket, the Riverfront Bengal Show, where we come to you with life, life tips, such as smell the milk first, and we yeah. teach you French. That may or may not be French. We need to get into life coaching. But this whole <laughs> podcast so. doesn't work out, and judging by our ratings and the tons of viewer that we have, we might need another line of work, but yeah, we should get into life coaching. This is a good point. I think the uh, the real money to be made there is not by people paying us to be their life coaches, by paying people to watch the live streams of the people that take our advice <laughs> out in the real world. Appointment viewing, get the popcorn. That's right. So some um, injury depth chart stuff before we get into a quick preview for week 14. Um, what are you hearing on Joe Mixon? Is he going to be back this week? Yeah, he was a full go today, meaning he is completely out of concussion protocol. Mm -hmm. It's funny. We were waiting to hear how, you know, how he's going to have that final check with the neurologist to see if he was going to go on Saturday. Zach Taylor told him on Saturday he's down. He didn't even go to the neurologist for clearance. They weren't even going to risk it. Again, when you've got P. Ryan that's playing as well as he is, it's kind of, you know, take your time, you know. We all saw what happened to Tua earlier in the year. Don't play around with that. Concussions are no joke. Exactly. Your brain's a little more important than, you know, than a game and – you know, well, especially because he got that money from that contract you didn't want him to have. Right, exactly. Because you, you hate Joe Mixon's family. Um, there's many <laughs> reasons why I don't <laughs> have that contract. But... We'll save that for an off-season podcast. Exactly. Um, who else? Yeah, Hayden... he's, uh, full participant, so he's good to go. Okay, awesome. Um, Hayden Hurst, you're saying that he's he's doubtful this week. He left in the second quarter last week which is why he did not beat up Justin Reed legally and sanctioned on the field. Yeah, he's um, – he won't – uh, Again, he he's hurt a little bit. Doubtful, but he's got – sorry. Um, he's in a uh, protect, protective boot. He's not going to play. Like, th- th- they've listed him, him as doubtful, but he's going to at least be gone for one week. Uh, it's the calf injury, so who knows how it's yeah. going to respond. But. Yeah, this, this one could hurt a little bit. I, I just love what he brings. I love the energy that he brings. We talk about it a lot on here, but they're they're pretty thin at tight end. So we'll see how they do. They did fine against the Chiefs, and, you know, t- time will tell. The only other piece of death chart news that I wanted to bring up was that Kevin Huber's gone. Oh, but no. is he gone? He got – Released, waived, whatever they call it in the NFL, and then re-signed to the practice squad. Um, that's pretty good. Yeah, I do I mean, know that you got to be you got to be pleased that he was willing to come back and sort of be a mentor to Drew Chrisman. That's exactly it. We we knew that this was going to be the last week that Chrisman was going to be on practice squad. You only get three elevations from practice squad to the uh, active roster on game day, and he had used this three. He's got nowhere near the attempts, nor will he have by the end of the season have enough attempts to qualify. But right now, he'd be second in the league in punting average and third in net. So, I mean, he's he's doing what he's asked to do. He's kicking the shit out of the ball. And, not, again, not that the Bengals are asking him to pin the team back and, you know, with the coffin corner kicks because if they're that close, they're just going to go for it or kick a field goal. But yeah, what you wanted him to do, what, you know, the reason that, they needed or that they needed to move on from Huber is he's you know he's gonna kick a 55 yards downfield and that's exactly what he's done. Uh Huber, the consummate pro, he didn't, you know, he there's I'm sure there was options for him to, you know, to kind of just stick as a free agent and try to latch onto a team if there's an injury. And since he's on practice squad, I guess he can still get plucked by another team, but he wants to stick around. He's a coach. You know, he's, he's a coach in uniform for Chrisman and for the mm-hmm. entire special teams. 
I mean, he's been here since 2009. So as a lifelong Cincinnatian, love having that guy around. Like he, yeah. he, any any question that Drew Christman is going to have, he's going to have the answer for it. And he kicked into the kicked in the Super Bowl last year, so he, you know he can at least help him out with a little bit of pressure and tell him kick better than I did because that's when the fans knew that I needed to lose my job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can't say any better than that. Um, so next week, week fourteen, Cleveland and the Dirty Browns. Or which I'm going to start calling that more often now that had a nice ring to it. Yeah, coming to Cincinnati for a 1 p.m. p.m. game. Uh, you know, it's, it's the first time that we will face Deshaun Watson in his Browns uniform. His second game since coming to Cleveland after a long holiday for uh, you know doing things that Deshaun Watson does. But <laughs> this is a big one for me. I think uh, you know Cleveland beat the brakes off. Cincinnati in week eight, 32 to 13. It was right, you know, on Halloween, it was thrashing. It seems to have been a bit of a wake up call for Cincinnati. But Burrow has never beaten the Browns. He's 0 and 4 in his career. So if he can exercise that demon, I think that, I don't know, I'm, I'm really intrigued by this game. I think that Cincinnati is a far, far, far superior club, but. They have been in the past, and it hasn't gone well for them. So what are, is jumping out to you about this matchup? One thing that's been completely glossed over, and I didn't even hear a lot about it at, uh, immediately after the fact, was the team had found out hours before kickoff that Adam Zimmer, you know, who was the, the, the assistant coach, is, um, they found out that he had died. Mm-hmm. And if that's not deflating, then I don't know what is. The team came out. They looked flat. I mean, they had the, especially yeah. on that first, you know, after the first drive, after there was the tipped interception, you could tell the team just kind of, I'm going to say fell apart, but they deflated it a lot. So, again, I'm not making excuses for them. They've struggled for whatever reason, you know, uh, with that team up north. But that's, you know, just provides a little bit of context. Um, but that being said, yeah, this is the week. I mean, Burrow has had weird games against Cleveland in his career. His second career game was against them, and he played through for like 400 yards. Um, but again, just, you know, made mistakes. The second game they played his rookie year, he, you know, threw the ball over the field, had him in it, uh, had him tied, and then the uh, Bengals allowed a game-winning go-ahead uh, score. Uh, then last year was just the first drive of the game. They drive all the way down to the end zone, and then he throws a 99-yard pick six to Denzel Ward. And just weird – Weird uh, turnovers happened in that game. Chase fumbled a ball right to them, and weird, fluky shit happens. Kind of like to the Steelers, except the Steelers at least yeah. have history being decent, and the Browns are suck, so it makes, it makes it worse. That's true. You know, the Browns do have Miles Garrett, and he is a game changing talent. So some of that's going to be chalked up to that. He's had some big games against yeah. uh, Burrow and Cincinnati in the past, but I think what's going to be really important in this game is that <laughs> Cleveland. Uh, Cincinnati cannot let Cleveland get out to an early lead. Their run game and pass rush are too good to be playing catch up. I would much rather than be in a position where they have to rely on the arm of Deshaun Watson, who, while incredibly talented, has not played much football lately. He's played with a lot of other things. Um, yeah. But this is if the defense can play against the pass, I mean, they held Patrick Mahomes to 100 yards per game less than he typically gets in a game where they were passing a lot. So I feel plenty confident in their ability to shut down that part of the game. And if they can take the ball out of Nick Chubb's hands, then I feel really, really good about this matchup. Yeah. Their offensive line struggling a little bit. Um, absolutely. Just stock, stack the box, put eight, nine guys in the box, make Watson make plays. If you saw his, like he, he looked terrible. The throws that he was, you know, the, the, the accuracy was just absolutely not there. He didn't have enough zip on it. Um, make him prove that he's, something close to what he was two years ago when he last played. Yeah. Um, just don't let Chubb run, you know, Chubb and Nick, uh, um, Kareem Hunt run all over the field. And, and I don't, th- and I'm confident that Lou's going to have at least a good game plan. Execution's another story, but I think if the Bengals can take care of the pig, again, fluky turnovers happen, tip balls and burrows, you know, on top of the list for most tip passes. And unfortunately, those have found their way into the hands of Cleveland. But take care of the ball and stack the box. And I think 
just the sheer overwhelming talent on the Bengals' offensive side. Is it, you know, Browns don't have a good defense outside of Miles Garrett. Yeah, that's exactly right. They have the 28th ranked defense in the NFL, which is not good. There aren't yeah. many more teams than 28. Um, they didn't have DJ Reader last time. Yeah. So big you know, team. the offensive line is playing way better now than it was in week eight. The entire team is playing far, far better than they were in week eight. So I think just reading the tea leaves here, I'm going to throw out my prediction. I've got a 31-17 victory by Cincinnati, and they're just going to shove it down their throat. They're going to be up by multiple scores at the half and then just slowly and methodically run the clock out, never looking back. What do you think? Uh, I think Deshaun Watson is going to try to a lot of rub routes. Uh, he's going to try to massage oh, the ball did. over the middle. Um, I don't think he's going to walk away with a happy ending, however. Oh, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. Um, no one ever predicts these, but I'm predicting a, a blowout. I'm predicting 34 to 13. Uh, offense is rolling every which way. Again, like we talked about, you know, off the top, what do the Browns want to try to take away? They want to try to take away, you know, take away the run and – you know, which, which has been the second most effective run game over the past two months. Well, great. You've got the most accurate quarterback in the league. You're going to play cover two shell to keep Chase from uh, running free in the secondary. Great. Burrow's the most accurate passer. He's going to find, you know, he's going to find guys all over the place, whether it's Mitchell Wilcox, Trent Irwin, Chase is going to get underneath. You still got Boyd and Higgins and throwing passes to the running backs. Yeah. You know, Mixon is bad. Jamar Chase wasn't in that game. Yeah. When we get even. Yeah. Um, I mean, as much as I love Hayden Hurst, I might be as big of a Hayden Hurst fan as there is. Of the skill position players, he's the one that they can most afford to withstand a week or two absence. Uh, Wilcox has actually played decently. I mean, he's graded out relatively well. He's a solid blocker, and he's got decent hands. Just make sure he's not your long snapper, and you're in good shape. Or, you know, at least you can handle it for, you know, for a week or so. Um, Get well because we need that energy. But this is a team I've I've got to win in thirty four to thirteen. I uh, just love it. This could be a big a big statement game. I think yeah. um, obviously we all know that the statement that is made by beating Kansas City, but to do that and then come right around after back to back awesome wins, and then coming back and shoving it down to Sean Watson and Cleveland's throat. I think uh, was was that a, uh, a was that intended? Oh, that was not. That was that was a bit of a slip. Wrap. Um, do you think that he chose to come to Cleveland because they had a star player whose name is Chubb? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's possible. Yeah. Um, other than that, um, I don't know what to, what to say. Enjoy this one. Enjoy this last win. It was great. But um, we were all a little bit worried when the Bengals got out to their slow start. And we saw how tough this, uh, this last stretch was going to be. And – they never doubted themselves. I can't say as fans, we don't doubt. That's what we do. We overreact to literally everything that happens. That's why we have a podcast. But if we're going to overact, overreact to the negative, we're going to do it over the positive too. And this is a really, really fun time. The team is playing as well as they have, and I don't even know how long. Let's enjoy it, Joe. Any 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 parting words of wisdom? Well, this this kind of proves – this is why you don't really look too much at the schedule. People talk about strength of schedule and who you have to face and when. A good team's going to win games. A bad team's going to lose games. This you know, this looked like absolute murderers row, the Titans, the Chiefs. And the Chiefs are a damn good team. I mean, Bills are a damn good team, and they got to play them. But they got to play you, too. It's, you know, it's 11 on 11. Um, this is the most confident and, – and not cocky. I mean, these aren't, you know, just a bunch of arrogant asswives that are, you know, going out and doing Justin Reed type shit. Um, this is a team that they know they deserve to, you know, they're not going to go out there and talk, talk smack and say that they're the best team. They're going to win the Super Bowl, but they're going to go out there and say, you yeah, know, we're, we're expecting to win these games. We're going to win this game because we're the better team. And it doesn't matter who's facing up on the other side with them. So, um, one thing I do want to mention, and this has kind of become a thing on, in Bengals, uh, Twitter, especially considering who the opposing quarterback is, and I will be doing this and I encourage others to. Every sack of Deshaun Watson, I will be donating ten dollars to probably the YWCA. Might be Women Helping Women. I'm going to try to find the, the probably the best um, the best charity to make sure you know for survivors. Uh, I encourage everyone to do the same. You know, love it. Uh, donate whatever you can. If it's a dollar, if it's five dollars, whatever. I go. I, I hope they go out and 
Trey Hendrickson has a Derek Thomas game and has eight sacks. I'm more than happy, you know, more than happy to make some nice big donations. Some people are saying they're going to uh, throw out $25 if Deshaun Washington gets hurt. Um, Ooh, I'll throw out a 25 spot if someone knocks him on his ass. These guys have wives and daughters and mothers that, you know, don't want to see that slime ball. So it's fair enough. Yeah. But, uh, great cause. You love seeing movement that there's moments like this when you realize that Twitter might actually have a, uh, a, a worth out there other than just people yelling at me for saying I like things. Um, yeah, that's an incredible cause. I will join you in that as well. I hadn't actually seen that. That's super cool. And anybody that does, please feel free to, uh, you know, post it on Twitter, tag us at TR Bengals show or email it to us at info at riverfrontcency.com. We'll try to put it out there and one, maybe one or two of our seven followers will get to see it. And that'll be cool. We can actually post them up on here too, on the yeah, podcast. Of course. Yeah, so, we, we will. I, I will say that right now. We will put, we will put your name. If you make a donation, and you know, you give us your details and everything. We will put that up next week on next week's episode. And we will also invite you to our award ceremony in the Micronation Empire. Of I'll pay for round trip airfare. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you to everyone and anyone for listening and supporting the Riverfront Bengals show. Please remember to subscribe to the show either on YouTube or in your favorite podcast app. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all of the good places. We are at TR Bengals Show on Twitter, and we are at Riverfront Cincy pretty much everywhere else. And, yeah, that's all I got for Joe Farsing. I'm Nate Dotson. Take it easy, y'all.